The Low Post is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post podcast under a foot of snow in Connecticut on Friday. Did some great sledding yesterday. I'm a very good sledder, if I do say so myself. And it's time for one of my favorite podcast episodes of the year as we near the tip-off of the 2020-2021 NBA season when Kevin Arnovitz and I pick our five most confusing teams for the upcoming season. We do not tell each other who we picked, so there's a little improvisation going on. Um, I'm I'm interested this season, K.A., because my five most confusing teams skew unusually toward good teams. Uh, there are very few mediocrities or bad teams in my, in my list. I'm curious to hear what your list is. But first, how are you doing, sir? I'm well. How are you? I'm good, man. Great sledding yesterday. Just fantastic. Uh, sledding is sledding is just a great time. I don't I don't ski, I don't don't snowboard, but I sled. I snowshoe you, occasionally. Snowshoe when, when I'm forced to go to a snow slash ski location. Have you seen the curb where Larry David goes skiing and it, and why skiing is not for him? I have never seen. I just don't like the schlepping with skiing. You're just that's what it is. That's what he said. He's he okay. can't even get from his car. Because he's got boots and skis. I don't like to be cold. I don't like to fall down at a high speed. And I just don't like a lot of stuff. There's too much stuff. Skiing's just not going to be for me ever. Yeah, that's, that's me too. I, it just it, it feels like work. It's manual labor. I'm on vacation. I want a hammock and a book and sand. It's like when I lived in New York, my evaluation for attending any social event was, am I going to be in transit to and from for more time combined than I will be at the social event. If yes, I'm not going. That was just, it's just like, if it's too much of a schlep, I'm just not going to do it. I'm too old for that. Anyway, okay. Five most confusing teams. Kevin, I love this podcast. I always defer to you. Who is your number one? I don't know if you rank them in cardinal order or whatever, but who is your number one most confusing team for the NBA season? Uh, Okay. Just real quick disclaimer. I promise it will be short. When I say a team is confusing, I do not suggest that they are defective. It's my confusion. It's my inability to sort of get a handle on what they are. And that is not any. So if this is your team, it, 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 I'm not impugning the executive. It is just me, Kevin Arnovitz. I don't know how to kind of approach this because I am a muddled thinker. So Is so that, with that not implied by the word confusing? You no, feel no, the I, need to preemptively describe what this exercise no, no, but is? I, I think like if I said, God, that. This if I if you were trying to explain something to me and I said I don't know man you're confusing, that's a critique that's a criticism you might take umbrage at that, that's not kind of the cycle here it is I am taking responsibility I am the evaluator who can't get it right and and I'm going to start with the Washington Wizards, not on my list okay I'm excited let's go so part of this is born out of our last podcast where I kind of just dismissed them yeah they're going to be a crappy defensive team and you know we'll see and. Um, a lot of spare parts. And, and I kind of dug in. Like, I really actually dug in after the Rust trade. And first of all, I think the Rust trade is fascinating because, you know, I, I think we can over-index. I've kind of reformed a little bit on the culture question where I think we kind of fetishize it and it's really a series of abstractions. And maybe Daryl Morey's right. It's a three-game winning streak. Um, but, you know, what was so interesting is for the first time in ages, and I'm talking like pre Gilbert arenas, like the Washington wizards, two best players are guys who are just like the trains are going to run on time. This is a complete sort of operation where serious people are trying to build a serious entity. And and like that, I think is kind of interesting. And, you know, I didn't love that they gave up the first, but when you started kind of drilling it down, it was good. And then like, I realized I like Troy Brown. I like Troy Brown last season. Um, Troy Brown is a really good alternate playmaker. Um, I love spacing. You know what? They've got a lot of spacers. And I I just started to put it together, and you consider how weak the East is. And I just kind of, you know, and by the way, I like Denny, one of my favorite rookies. So um, you start kind of figuring out they have a lot of different ways they can go schematically. Um, you know, they can put Russ and, and Bradley Beal on the floor with with Rui and Troy. Um, obviously, Davis Bertans gives you a ton of spacing, which I like for Russ, right? Like, I think Russ is, you know, Russ has always played on lousy spacing teams. 
I mean, ever since Durant left OKC, really, that was always a little bit rigor mortis. He gets to Houston, obviously, you know, James Harden's James Harden, but there's just, it was a little bit better, and I think we saw in the last two months of the season, that when he has afforded space, he can make better decisions, both in terms of shot selection and then I think in terms of playmaking. I think defensively, it's going to struggle. Um, I think they're just going to have, they're just, they're kind of wimpy last season. They were never, they're one of the least physical teams I observed. You can use the S word. You can use the S word. Just use it. Just say it. It's okay. It's not radioactive. Just say the S word. Soft. Just say it. They played soft last yeah, year. I mean, like, yeah, okay. Soft and from a physical standpoint. I don't like soft when you talk about mental makeup. because that's No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. It's a word I just this, think is terrible. Few guys in this league are as mentally tough as Brad Beal. That exactly. guy will give it everything he's got every night. He carried that team last year. That was a nothing team. Now, defensively, did he take a step back? Sure, maybe. But when you're trying to average, when you have to average 30 every single game to give your right. team any chance in hell of being within five points in crunch time, your defense is going to slip. Yeah, and they're a little more versatile defensively. They also have, here's the other thing. They were crappy rebounding team last year. I mean, they lost games on the margins that they probably shouldn't have lost. What I really like about Russell Westbrook is he's a really good rebounder. It's something that I think I have always discounted Russ because I don't love the superstar profile. Like, he's not an efficient shooter. Like, he's never, he. I was one of the ranked him third that year that we had the big debate with Kawhi Harden and, and Westbrook. But one thing I really value is he is coming into a weak rebounding team as a strong rebounder. He's going to clean up a lot of that. Well, and um, also Robin Lopez it, exactly. who's not going to start is perfect for him because Robin Lopez just wants to box people out. He's like Stephen M. Just, oh, I'll just box everyone out. You all get the rebounds. Perfect for us. Perfect. You get every rebound, Russ. I'll just box out four dudes yeah. at once. But but I think more than anything, I, I just like that the Washington Wizards, the worm is going to turn. And and it's hard to have this conversation without Im- implying that John Wall was the problem. But I just feel like, okay, Russ is going to come in. By the way, I don't think they're going to be great. I don't think they're a top four or five seed. But I just think, you know, Russ comes in. He's playing for a coach where he played his best basketball, right? Like there's institutional knowledge that they – that they, you know, that they kind of share. Bradley Beal gets sort of a like-minded teammate, really for the first time in his career, who can kind of perform at a common level. And I feel like when you say the word institutional knowledge, I should I should take a drink. I feel like that should be a th- like I, one time per episode that phrase comes out of your mouth, and I feel like no. I should I should memorialize it somehow. Institutional knowledge that's that's an overused phrase of mine. No, not overused. I thought I thought it was like gravitas was the one you always Ooh, pointed out. Ooh, that one, that one. That's that's a tequila shot right there. That's it's an eleven really a.m. tequila shot. Well, look, um, it's Friday. It's Friday, and the NBA season's four days away. I got to get it in now or never, man. But I, I just think you know what the Wizards are interesting, and I was a this, little too dismissive. I put them, I think, a little farther closer to the Charlotte, Chicago realm, and I think I should be talking about them in the Atlanta realm. I think. Then again, if they're ranked twenty sixth and defense this year I also wouldn't be surprised and as we know there's a ceiling to that but so I'm confused but I'm sort of confused with an upward trajectory uh swinging positive Uh, I just kind of like how it feels right now versus a month ago so let me let me be clear so you're you're not saying this is a team that's going to crack the top five or six in the east you're saying play in it seems like you're saying seven eight nine play in or bust kind of feeling about the Wizards is that fair yeah like like hosted play in and by the way if there are you know, if there are injuries, if there is unfortunately, you know, a, a COVID strike of a team, like I think Washington could string together three really good weeks of basketball in a 72 game season. I think there is more room for randomness. You get hot, you get, you stay healthy. You could possibly penetrate that. But I, I, I just, I'm more positive on them. And and again, Russ is sort of the captain of the, there will be nights all-stars, a team that also stars Buddy Heel, like guys who... You know, I, I think can. I saw Buddy Heald has taken 37 threes in four preseason games. Like, let it fly, fantastic. buddy. When he um, comes, he's he is the co captain of the There Will Be Knights All Stars, which is a player who, by virtue of just their sheer sheer heat, can basically win you a game. I My guy for that is Bobby Portis. If you watch the right 15 games every year, Bobby Portis is like, you'll be like, is this guy first team all NBA? This guy's incredible. And I, I like having a guy like that because he's going to, in the regular season, he's going to win you a couple of random games because he has a crazy game. Anyway, um, I'm with you on the whiz. I think that they sh- it's play in or bust for them. If they don't get, and maybe, ho- like you said, they're in contention to host a play in tournament game. If they don't make the play in, something bad has happened to their team. 
To your point about Russ, you know, I wrote about this when he was with the Thunder and I interviewed Nick Collison about it. And I'll never forget it because it was a really good interview. And Nick, Nick was Nick as the cultural touchstone of that team was always very open about the sort of inner workings of their X's and O's anyway. Rarely did they give Russ any opportunity to run spread pick and roll there, right? Like Russ, Steven Adams and three shooters. They got to it a little bit more as they as they as they got closer to Durant's exit. So it would be like Russ, Waiters, Durant, and another guy who is a decent shooter whose name I'm blanking on. It doesn't matter. When they would get to those alignments with Durant at the four, like Russ was unstoppable. He was in the lane at will, spraying out passes to shooters, lobbing to Steven Adams. I once interviewed Steven Adams and said, man, you're starting to look like Tyson Chandler dunking alley oops and he was like in his little Stephen Adams like, oh it really made Tyson Chandler that's a t- I can't do it. I can't do it at New Zealand <laughs> it doesn't matter I'm not even gonna try um and people would go under screens but Russ was so explosive he would just beat you to the spot and he'd be at the rim if you tried that a lot of times and I think he still has that in him and I think this ecosystem is going to be like that for him so that even if you know, people are worried he's going to take the ball out of Brad Beal's hands too much. Yes, that's going to happen. That's fine. But, like, I think this ecosystem is good for him. And, by the way, part of the reason I think that is I'm really bullish on Thomas Bryant as an offensive center, a starting caliber offensive center. He's shooting a lot of threes. He's a good shooter. He's an explosive dive guy. But, as you said, if you're – he's not – he has not been a good defender, although I thought he made progress in the bubble. He's been a terrible rebounder. He does the thing where he gets caught – trying to block shots too late and so he does nothing he doesn't block the shot and he's out of rebounding position that you he does that a lot but i just think this is going to be a really good offensive team and if if they can get to 20th on defense somehow i i think it's a play in shoe in for them i i like their team and the one thing i will say though is i think there was reporting this week that they're going to be pretty cautious with russ on back-to-backs and so that's something that you're going to have to monitor but i i didn't put them on my list as confusing because I think I I'm confident I have them pegged pretty well. I think that's what they are. And, um, and that's what it is. Yeah. I, I mean, and by the way, I, I would like the ball taken out of Bradley Beal's hands sometimes because he was overworked. And by the way, he's a really good off ball player. You know, all of the Paul George complaint. Look, I don't want to, I don't want to run him around single singles all night, but I think that can be really effective. And again, it, it Russ plus spacing is a different player. And, I, I, I'm with you. You have Bertans out there. You have Bryant. You have Peel. You know, I, I mean, we'll see. I mean, Brown, I think, can become. I, I think it's a decent stroke. I think that's a 37% shooter waiting to happen from from distance. I just think there's so much room for him to operate. And again, if defenses meet him in the paint, you're right. There's somebody, you know, at the rim who can be a recipient. And I, I just, I, I'm sort of liking it. And the reason they're confusing me is again, because I didn't like it a month ago and largely because I didn't really look. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to continue to defer to you because I, 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 I have a good, something in my gut is telling me that your number two confusing team is going to be on my list too, that we're going to overlap. I feel it. I feel it in my gut. Mm-hmm. Just like I knew my wife and I were going to have a girl. I knew it. I felt it in my gut and I was right. I, so I'm feeling it now. All right. Kevin Arnovich, number two confusing team. Who is it? So because I don't rank now, I'm trying to look on my list and see which one. No, Don't overthink it. Don't think. overthink it. Just okay, go. Okay, okay. The New Orleans Pelicans. Yes. All right. You got it. I knew it. Okay. Tell me why. So, okay. So first of all, what is the goal there? And I, and I think they're trying to win. I, I Obviously, I think the personnel that they've accumulated suggests this is a team that wants to succeed, wants to get into the playoff, wants to make some noise. You know, the Adams extension to me is fascinating. Because on one hand, what is the market for that guy, um, given what we know about centers these days? Uh, probably less than they're paying him. You know um, what, though? One caveat I'll give that, and I've seen Hollinger has been really critical of that deal, too. And I get it. I get I'm it for semi-critical, exactly. but I get it. Yeah. I, I, I Here's the one thing. I think all the extensions to the Tatum, Mitchell, Bam, Fox, etc. group, Paul George extension— Likely Kawhi Leonard resigns, potential Rudy Gobert extension. All of a sudden, next summer is a lot of cap space and not a lot of guys. And I think that that Adams deal will look less damaging once we get through all those things. I also think just apropos of nothing, I'm kind of surprised given that cap environment. And we're only three days from the deadline that we haven't seen 
any extensions yet for this group of rookie rookie scale eligible guys because I think teams should look at that and say, oh boy, you know, there's a chance that John Collins is going to get the max or Derek White's going to get more than we want. Let's try to lock him up now. But that's apropos of nothing. Continue on the Pelicans. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, I, I think that's interesting also because yeah, here's another reason why they're confusing. And I'm going to take a detour here. You know, you look at the personnel and you're like, God, they need more shooting. And then you dig in and it was like, they're bringing back three guys who are high volume, high usage, three point shooters, right? Like Ingram, I didn't even realize he was 39%. I mean, obviously I know he had a great year. I don't think of him as a shooter. He doesn't, there's always been something a little off there. Um, it, it's not pure. And yet, wow, he hit it 39%. I had forgotten that Lonzo somehow learned how to shoot the three at a pretty consistent level. Then he, you then know? he, then he unlearned it before the bubble. Of course. And, but I, I think there's enough of a history and, and, and I think work ethic there that, that he could potentially get it back. And then obviously JJ is running around making what 50, I, Lord knows how many percent of his threes. It's, it's insane. And okay. So here I am. My instinct is, well, they don't have enough shooting on the floor. You know, they're replacing holiday with Bledsoe. And then of course you look at the numbers and, you know, holiday is a guy who I think we visualize as like a great outside shooter. And it turns out he's adequate. Um, Bledsoe is a guy who you think is terrible and it turns out he's adequate. I mean, he's less adequate than holiday. So do they not have a lot of shooting or do they have a lot of shooting? Um, I know they have a fair amount of playmaking and I like that. Um, Bledsoe can get to the rim. I mean, I've been extremely critical of his playoff performances, but he has the strength and he has, I, I, I think a vision for himself to get there. Um, he's not as bad of a passer as I think most of us imagine obviously Lonzo was Lonzo he makes fantastic plays um and, and Ingram's gotten better this is not straight line drive tunnel guy anymore I don't think I think he's, he's a, Ingram's a good passer I, like, yeah. I think Ingram I think Ingram is a B passer who has a chance to be an A minus passer yeah and was frankly a CC plus for the beginning of his career really till he got to New Orleans um and that might have just been environmental um so they're trying to win and obviously Zion we haven't even talked about now the funny thing is Zach I want to see Zion at the five a little bit. I, I look, I know they've invested in Adams. I know he's a great culture guy. I just kind of want, I feel like they're going to be nights where they're going to have to do this. Um, and they'll be really good because you get a lot of, you can space a little more. I think Zion is kind of a modern five. Um, so that was the other thing with Adams. It wasn't so much the number or the length. I am mindful of the fact that people are just going to be throwing money at random guys next season. Um, yes, I think centers are cheaper, but also, okay, that's an interesting way to go with a guy like Williamson that I think should play alongside more space. This is my number one most confusing team in the NBA. I have absolutely no idea what to expect of them. No clue. Was really high on them before the bubble, then they shit the bed in the bubble. Zion looked horrible. You hear their Zion stats in the bubble. Are you ready? So in the regular season with Zion on the floor, Plus 10 points per 100 possessions. And as I've dove, I've dived, dove, dove, dove is definitely another word, dove or dived uh, into before, a lot of that was defense and a lot of that was luck. Just bad opponent three-point shooting. Some of it was New Orleans offense was a lot better. Their offensive rebounding was monstrous, so teams couldn't leak out, that kind of stuff. But a lot of it was luck. In the bubble, was Zion on the floor? Are you ready for this? Yes. Minus 24 points per 100 possessions, which is like, if you put me on the floor for ten for for like a hundred NBA minutes with the right personnel around me, I might not be minus twenty four for a hundred possessions. I might be able to do better than that. Um, and so they were so bad in the bubble that I'm left confused. I don't think they have enough shooting. To your point, I think they're going to try to play really really fast. I think they have to play really fast, even when they were rolling with and without Zion pre bubble. Their half court offense was poo poo. And you just can't play in transition all the time, not even in the regular season. You can't play. You're still going to have 75% of your possessions are going to be in the half court. So that worries me a little bit. And Stan, his teams have always played in the 20s in pace with a couple of exceptions that were like 11th or 12th. Is he going to run? Are they going to really run? Are they going to get out and play the way they have to play? Are they going to force a lot of turnovers, which is something that Stan's teams have typically not done? I just don't know what to expect of this team. I don't know if I believe in Lonzo's three-point shooting. Um, Zion at center is an interesting wild card. I think it will just remain a wild card. I think they'll use it. I think it'll be a regular part of their rotation. But between Adams and Hayes and even Melly, you know, 
who can he hang defensively? We'll see. But I, I like their team. I like their depth. I think you're dead on about the playmaking. You like see depth is a, a concern of mine a little bit. Well, I mean, you bring you bring Hart and Reddick off the bench, okay. and so that that's a two rock solid guys. I thought Josh Hart had a really nice year last year. Only shot thirty four percent from three, but I thought his all around game. And I'm still a real- Nikhil guy. Like I think there's something there. People like Lewis, like their young guys will get better. Is Hayes ready for a big role? I don't know. Like I, I can see what you're saying. That depth is that depth is could be a little bit of a concern. There's there's just a, a, a sheer level of talent here that is interesting. I just I just throw my hands up in the air. I, I want to see what they look like. I want to see how they play. I want to see what the results are. Right now, I have them penciled in as sort of the equivalent of where I had the Wizards and Hawks in the East is sort of a, a play-in team that could host a play-in a play-in tournament. Some people have them higher than that. Uh, but that's sort of my equivalent of just shrugging. I just don't know. Yeah, I, and, you know, it's funny. One of the great contradictions, and, and obviously they have too much talent to, to even stealth tank, but I, I, one of the most fascinating things about this season is there are two reasons to tank uh, that have never been more prominent. I mean, one is our, our friends who handicap these things this is a terrific draft class in 21. The other is one of the disincentives to tank is like when you're not winning and particularly when you fall out revenue at the gate and the associated revenue streams just goes through the floor. Like it's terrible this year. You will not be penalized for that for much of the season. It it looks as if, and obviously the 21 draft. And yet there's only one team in the West that is sort of unequivocally not trying to win. Um, and it's also the team that owns 41% of all future draft picks in the league. And that's the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, it, it, you know, New Orleans, Zion's health is also, I mean, that's well, not that, a con- yeah, that was That was implied right. by how bad he was in the bubble. He was not in shape. He just right. did not look good. And, and like, I got to see, I just got to see what he looks right. like. It, to me, that's the greatest source of confusion. And, and so far as you can't handicap them is like, you just don't know um, how frequently he can play. And especially in a slightly compressed schedule. Um, it, I interviewed uh, I interviewed Griff yesterday for a story I'm working on about the Pelicans, and he used a word to describe Zion. It's a simple word, but I, I it, it just really struck me as it's the perfect description of Zion. He said Zion is so sudden that it, it <laughs> catches defense, and like sudden is exactly like you can use the word explosive, ferocity, whatever, but like sudden was such a good word because he's from catch to rim. If you blink your eye, you will miss it, and they'll be going back on defense. He's so sudden. It was a perfect thing. I also think their offense will have a little more structure this year. I think Stan will introduce more structure. It'll be less free-flowing. I think they're going, based on what I've heard, they're going to try and unlock Zion as a ball handler a little more. Like We'll see some Zion Ingram pick and rolls. We'll see stuff like that. Um, But to your other point about tanking, this is an organization that understands its market and that the Saints are everything, and they need to, even in a, in a year with no fans, they need to get a, gain a foothold, keep whatever foothold they have. And number two, I really think the lottery reforms have changed the league. Like, we've seen all teams tank and end up picking fifth, sixth, seventh. And I, I, I think it has worked, and that whether you think it's quote-unquote fair or not, I think it has worked to disincentivize just out-and-out tankery uh, at least a little bit because you just don't you just don't know you have the same chances the top three teams have the same chances like I just it's not a lock anymore and I think teams have begun to realize that now Oklahoma City is is clearly in rebuild mode but you know they have some okay players they have some good players on their roster I I I think the lottery reforms have done their job and it's been a wake-up call for teams who have really tanked seasons and ended up end up picking at spots that just aren't all that profitable yeah, and you just – with Zion, I mean, two things. One is the sudden is great because it's also the size makes the shock all the more pronounced, right? Like, like, look, it's one thing to have, you know, an explosive talent explode past you. It's another thing to watch that guy with that kind of mass do it as suddenly as he does it. And also, I love the playmaking because, again, I think the, the virtue of this team is the number of guys who can make plays, and it can compensate for – a lack of shooting and a lack of range, you know, um, you know, I'm always fascinated at teams that sort of have to get around that. I mean, the Quinn Snyder teams of of a few years ago where there just wasn't a lot of kind of range and shot creation on the floor, um, having to sort of create a half court offense 
you know, out of lemons and, and making that lemonade. And I, I think that that's going to be fun to watch in New Orleans. Like I'm actually like I'm very it's a team I'm going to watch a lot because I, I it, it just they just kind of produce curiosities and including Zion and, and just how they're going to use each guy in each piece. By the way, do we think how long do we think over under how long will Bledsoe be? Will, will Eric Bledsoe be on that roster beginning of next season? I'll, I'll go without having put any thought into it. I'll go no, just okay. because um, just because it, it, he seems like a player who will bounce around a little bit. I, I just I haven't thought of it, but I'll go no. Um, 538, which came out with their projections yesterday, has the Pelicans at 36 and 36 and even 500 um, with a 42% chance to make the playoffs. I'm a little higher on them than that. Um, I think they have an upside if all things go well for them. At, like, could they finish six? I think that's potential. I don't. I will not pick them to do that. I don't think all things are going to go right for them. I think they're a play-in team, uh, but I do think they are one of my curiosities. I will watch them a lot for all the reasons you've outlined. Okay, I do feel again in my gut the same feeling that your next team is also going to be on my list. So I will continue to be a generous host. I am a very generous. When people come to my house, which we can't do anymore because it's cold. I am very generous with wine and cheese and crackers. Although my 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 setup, my presentation, okay, as they would say on the Great British Bake Off, has been critiqued as sloppy. But I'm very generous with the volume of food and drink that I put out. So I'm being a generous host, and I think your next team is also going to be on my list. So KA, give it to me, third team. By the way, for a uh, offline conversation, your recommendation led me during after when I was recovering from my surgery this summer to do the Bake Off. And I quite enjoyed it, and it is just sort of a happiness machine. Um, so I, I thank you for the recommendation. How many seasons have you done? I just did one, but uh, I, who, which who was the crew? Who was the cast? Oh, it was the oh god, I can never remember. Not the, the contestants. Just, like, who's the judges? Who's the who oh, are the four? Oh, that um, that old woman who's just fantastic. I don't well, know the names. They're, they're both they're both old. Mary and Barry then, and Mary Barry and Prue. Prue yeah. is the and, and glasses. Then the, uh, did she wear colorful glasses? Wait, the judge or the, the 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 host? The judge, the judge. No, no, she was just an older woman who like was out of central casting, and no, it's Mary Berry. Mary Berry's. Yeah, no, it was. That was the name. That was the name. That was the name. I mean, I was very impaired as I watched these shows. So um, Sue and Mel, Sue and Mel were the hosts. And then, no, the, yes, um, the short haired lady who's kind of funny and sassy and S- Sue. Yeah. Yeah, like her. And uh, the guy was the other judge. He was kind of harsh. He was like the Simon Cowell of. First of uh, all, it's not the guy. You can't come on this podcast. And not know the name of Paul Hollywood. Okay, Are, you can't oh, just call him the guy. It's underbaked. It's underbaked. It's not you in the credits. It's like you know when a show has like a dramatic show has the credits. I want to see the names. Okay, and then they just go right into like a tart or something. And it the was fun. A team. The A team. And I'm just gonna say it now because Windhorse refuses to do the Great British Bake Off podcast with me. The A team is. Paul Hollywood, Mary Berry, Sue, and Noel. That's it. I will hear no other answers. Give me your third team now. No more Bake Off. Um, for the same reason, every year they're a confusing team because they're projected to be middling and I just see them as much better. The Portland Trailblazers. Not on my list. I was wrong. Okay. I, I will give you a quick Portland. Go. You can, you can justify it, but we're going to move on quick because I'm not confused by them at all. But go. Give me your okay. reasons. Uh, as usual, like I look at the projections. I think these are intelligent people running intelligent models and they all have them as a middling play in team. And I look at a team that basically has the best pick and roll player in the league and Damian Lillard, who's going to be an MVP candidate this year. Um, CJ McCollum, who would be an all star in the East every year. They had weaknesses, you know, defensively. I think they fortify them. Look, I know Covington's not the one through five defender everyone thinks he is, um, as, as demonstrated in the OKC series, but like he's freaking good. Um, He also provides range. They are stacked in the front court with a lot of interchangeable parts and Nurk is back. And, you know, I I just think they're they're just they have like five playable bigs um, in various contexts. I think they can go big this year. I think they can go small. I think there's range. Uh, Gary Trent Jr. was was a revelation. I know you've been on that island for a while. Um, I, I just see a lot of strengths and not that many weaknesses. And so why am I seeing them projected eighth or ninth when I see them as a top four potential seed if everybody's well, well, Pelton had them Pelton's system had them ninth, but like three wins away from third. So okay. people fixated on the ninth a little bit, I think, and did not really notice how grouped together it was. Five thirty eight has them at forty and thirty two. That's and, good. And and I think well, they have them behind the Rockets, which is like pfft. 
whatever. Uh, and uh, behind the Mavericks and behind the Jazz, like six in the West, I think. I'm I'm higher on them than that. I with you. I, I'm with you. I like their offseason. Um, I, I think they have some good depth, particularly when Zach Collins comes back, which is still kind of a month away from what I've heard. Yeah, about January. Um, uh, I think I just I also just think. I think Nurkic is underrated. I think Nurkic is really, really good. Like in the East, he would be an all-star candidate. He's just not going to reach that level in the West because it's too good. And I, he fits, he plays really well off Dame and CJ. Um, they're, they're post, and, and look, like we'll see how they do in the playoffs. They, they did make the conference finals two years ago and they had an easy road there, relative, relatively speaking. But I, I, I'm high on the Blazers. Um, I, I've said before, it wouldn't surprise me if they finished third in the West. Um, that's I, I think I don't think they will, but it wouldn't shock me. I think they're just a really good team. I think they're yeah. I I think they are um, top six. So outside of play in, if they were in the play in tournament, to me that would qualify as disappointing. Likewise, and again, it, to, to your point about Nurk and everything else, like they can run pretty much any brand of offense, any package. They're not a fast team and never will be, and I don't think they have to be. And that's also another thing I like about them. You know, we talk about all these teams. There's a lot of crappy half-court uh, sort of uh, treading water teams in this league, largely because I think the league has so much become random and early offense and transition. Like like the Portland Trailblazers are a big boy offensive half-court team. They can run stuff out of the post. They run those little flares they've been doing for 75 years, um, you know, with, with CJ and Dame. They've got range. They've got you know, some bigs who can pass. They'll come in with Carmelo to sort of bully ball for, you know, five, six minutes. Um, they're just, you know, Harry Giles had a great game the other night. I love passing big men. I just think, and then they can, you know what, they can play a little Ennis Cantor post game for five possessions and score freaking nine points. You know, it, it's like, I just think that there's just, they have a lot of different ways to go. And I think they're really, I think they could be really good this season. Um, I'm with you. I, I, I like the Blazers. I think they're good. I like Nurk like everything about their team, like their uniforms, like their court. And Terry Stotts, like their defense was so bad last year. He has a history and their teams have a history with their conservative scheme, which is a little boxy in some ways yeah. of like ringing. I mean, they've had top 10 defenses with personnel that you look at and like, meh, they've had average defenses. Like, I don't think it's a lock that they're just this horrible defensive team, particularly with Covington. I think they could be average or even yeah. a little bit better if some things hit right. I'm taking control now. We're going down my list now. Yeah, let's do it. My next most confusing team. Look, it wouldn't be the Low Post podcast if they didn't come up. It just wouldn't be. They have to come up. My white whale, the team that I go to sleep thinking about and wake up thinking about, the Philadelphia 76ers. <laughs> Are they on your list? No, they're not. They should be, but they're not. Um, to recap... The 76ers traded Al Horford in a first-round pick for Danny Green, traded Josh Richardson in a high second-round pick for Seth Curry. Their projected starting five is those two plus Embiid, Simmons, and Tobias Harris. So three shooters, although Tobias, will you just shoot when you're open from three, please? But three shooters, including one of the greatest shooters of all time in, in Seth Curry, uh, around the big two. Um, their bench is, is a source of curiosity for me. <laughs> um, it could really... And I think it's the reason why I'm confused about them. So, like, Shake Milton, a lot of hype, looks good sometimes. Can it happen? Matisse Teibel, a lot of hype, incredible defensive player. How good can he get from three? Can he dribble? Like, can he pump and go and make the next play? Furkan Korkmaz will have four games where he's on fire from three, then he'll vanish for a month. Dwight is Dwight. I like the Dwight signing. I think they need a little ballast for Joel. Um, you know, the Maxi kid has looked good in preseason. Um, there, Mike Scott is, again, one of those guys who for a five-game stretch comes out and he's on fire and then he disappears for a month. To me, the bench is the big question mark. And it's a big question mark for this reason. We're all very excited about Danny Green and Seth Curry, right? All of us in Sixer land, which I just now am a resident of, because they fit, right? And last year, the pieces didn't fit. And so we're so excited about fit and shooting, and Ben's going to run wild, and Joel's going to have space to post up. And yeah, they fit. That fit. Fit's cool. Like, fit's cool. You know what else is cool? Talent. Talent is really cool. And Seth Curry, for as good as he is, has mostly been a backup in his career. And as a starter, we'll see how he holds up defensively. He's mostly been a backup for a reason. Danny Green, 
is starting to get toward the end, starting to get a little creaky, and looked creaky again in the playoffs for the second straight season. So I think in our exuberance, in perhaps in my, I'm projecting here, in my exuberance about how well the pieces fit, I think we are overrating the talent of those pieces and and what role they should really play on teams, but they, they do fit. So between that and the bench that I just don't know what to make of on a day-to-day basis, I don't know what this team is going to be, but I know they have two absolutely hellacious defenders in their starting five. I know Joel Embiid posting up. He had his best post-up season by far last year. Lowest turnover rate, highest points per possession with open space is is uh, monstrously effective. And they will stagger Ben and Joel presumably to give him super spacing. And ditto for Ben in transition with shooters around them. Everyone wants to compare this team to the 2018 team that had Redick, Covington, and Saric around those two guys. I see it. I get it. Everyone fetishizes that team. It didn't end up doing all that much, but whatever. I think their ceiling is they could be trouble. Like their ceiling is they could be real trouble in the playoffs. Conference finals? Maybe better. I don't know. I'm a little afraid. I'm a little scarred by how much I liked their team last year and how bust it went. Um, But they could also just kind of be like, Six in the East and losing the first round. What's your take? I think it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch because they have to hide a lot of individual deficiencies. You know, um, Ben Simmons is, needs no further discussion. I mean, Danny Green cannot dribble. Um, Tybal has very limited offensive skills. Um, we'll see if, you know, Seth Curry, defense, right? And, and, and like, is he an off-the-dribble guy? No. Like, how many of those guys they have? Um, Tobias Harris, um, who is you know, the consummate above average player in this game getting paid obviously much more handsomely. And, and every guy, and, and Joel has his limitations, right? Like, I mean, he, he is, he's a phenomenal basketball player. And, I, and, and again, he is, he is right now in terms of low post. I mean, there's just so much um, damage he can exact against a defense and he's getting so really good, much, much better. I think at recognizing seams, um, I think he's become a better passer out of the double team. I think he's going to become even better at that. I just like there are there are no complete, really really complete ball players on that team, right? Like like every guy is sort of a quasi specialist who is kind of improving a couple of other skills, or a guy like Green who was a really top specialist who could tread water in these other areas, who's lost a step defensively. So he's no longer on my kind of my, he was my perennial second team, all defensive guard for many years. Um, they're just not a lot of fully complete basketball players on this, um, on this roster. And, and so now can the sum of the parts be better than the individual parts? Maybe. I mean, Simmons is a locomotive. I love what you can do with them. There is some versatility on this roster, but they're just also a lot of limitations. There's going to be a lot of whack-a-mole. There's some low-hanging fruit for them that gets to the fit, right? So last year, they were 21st in their percentage of shots that were threes. And kind of shockingly for an Embiid team, 24th in the percentage of their shots that came at the basket, which means they shot a whole lot of long twos. Uh, They also shot 37% on threes, which was sixth, and (laughs) 65% on shots at the rim, which was seventh. So like... They, they're if you if you projected their field goal percentage by where they took their shots and that's it they were 26 like their shot distribution is terrible but they were 10th in effective field goal percentage because they finish well and they shoot well and again there's this idea that they have no shooting because Simmons doesn't shoot threes but again they were seventh in three point shooting last year actually tied for sixth and like a little percentage point out of fifth like they have some shooting and they have more shooting this year so i think there's some low hanging fruit i just again it's 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 the and like in the playoffs i think one of the things that was really hammered home to me is the best teams have two guys who can create their own shots at an elite level and preferably at least one of those guys is a is a either a big wing or in in denver's case a big guy who's one of the greatest clutch shooting big men already ever and philly still i think has one until we see Simmons do it, he he hasn't done it. Until we see Tobias Harris really do it at a high level, I, I you know. So I I'm I'm a little skeptical still, but I don't know, man. I I every time I look at the roster, I see the shooting. I get a little I get a little excited like I was last year, and I have to dial. I have to check myself. I have to dial it back. Yeah, I mean Harris is confounding in that way, right? Like 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 it, he is, it, it, and this is where my issue is with them, right? Like like he is the most complete player 
on the roster in terms of also, you know, sort of volume potential and okay, I can score any number of ways. And like, I don't, is that like, if that's the answer to that question, no. I think there's a limited ceiling on a team. And by the way, I, I'm not discounting Embiid and, and his ability just to wreak havoc on defenses, but I, I just, there's just something, look, now here's the, let me counter myself. If they can figure out how to hide Curry, wow, this is a really good, could we be talking about the number three defensive team in the league? And then you do that thing where, oh, if they're 13th offensively, okay, now what are we talking about? And I, um, and, and that that's sort of, but I just feel like there are, there's just too many vulnerabilities for too many guys that can be exposed too many ways. Well, that's one of the reasons they make more sense is not just on offense, but defensively with a more normal lineup and not Horford in there as a second center, basically. Uh, Tobias Harris can guard fours now. He's better at guarding fours than threes. I think he improved at guarding threes. And Simmons can just guard anybody one through three. And then you just hot you. So it gives you more flexibility and sort of stashing Seth Curry on the weakest opposing player. So I think they make more sense in that regard. But I have them. Well, you'll see where I have them in my tiers column next week. But I, I don't have them in the quite in the inner circle of of like would be challengers to to the Lakers. I, I, maybe because I'm scarred from last year, or maybe because of all these other logical reasons. Um, to to be a little not dubious because I think they're going to be really good, but not quite exuberant. Okay, Kay, back to you. Give me your next. Yeah, team. I mean, I was going to let like you go. You have better teams. This okay, year. okay, all right. I'll be okay. No, I want you to go because I've discussed both my teams. I've discussed already this year, so I don't on recent podcasts. So I want to give you the floor in case we get a wild card team. All right, the Sacramento Kings. See, that's what I'm talking about. Not confused by them at all. Wild card team. Let's go. Why are you confused about the Sacramento Kings hashtag? Okay, so this was a team that I think two years ago we projected to be on its way to a low seven eight kind of seed. The worm had turned in Sacramento. We were going to see them contend. Not for a, 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 the West, obviously, but but this was a team building the nucleus to be, you know, a 44, 45 win team getting better with the Aaron Fox and Bagley. Yes, we've all mourned the uh, the Luca whiff, but hey, there, there's some good pieces here. Bogdan was fun. They were a blast to watch two years ago. Um, they've kind of settled back. I think we're all projecting them at the very maybe sneaking into the play in mix they still have fox and marvin bagley that is going to be sort of the, the pinpoint they made a great by the way i just have to say this neither you nor i watch a hell of a lot of college basketball i i watch basically none what i do enjoy doing is after the draft sort of getting the i watch like an iowa state texas game with tyrese halliburton the hype is there man i thought this guy was like okay to me, when you're picked at that spot that says great shooter, probably not a lot else there, like a, a rich man's John Jenkins, holy crap, Zach. This guy, he has a pick and roll game. He has this way of a hard dribble, defense meets him, and he slings the ball. Skip pass to an open guy. This, this guy, is the most enthusiastic I've ever seen you on this podcast. You're mimicking – people can't see you're mimicking swing passes to the corner. It's like – this kid is like, how did he fall this far? Like, am I, I look, I'm not a scout. And I, I watched now a total of, in addition to some other clips, I've probably watched a total of 28 minutes of this kid. But holy cow, is he good and fun. I just like, like and, one of my, and, this and by the guy, way, I'm gonna, yeah. And ready, ready to play now. <sighs> ready to play, not a project, not someone we're going to have to wait a year on. He's ready to be in the rotation now, you know, well, we'll see. I don't want to project too far. I, I'm very excited about Tyrese Halliburton. Many oh, of the scouts man. I know were like were telling me preemptively, you are going to love Tyrese Halliburton, and I love him. I love him. It makes me a little more excited about the Kings. Yeah, I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch some more Kings basketball this season. I did it a couple of years ago. I took a break last year. Um, I just it was blah. Um, just not fun. again. There's a certain point where you're in the middle of the league and you're sort of in the 500 Mendoza line kind of teams where it's just you 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 and you do the best column on this. Uh, in the world, but like you, you kind of just, you're looking for entertainment value and, and the Kings had it and then they didn't. And I think they're going to have it again. Um, how good are they going to be? I don't know. Um, I also think it's in interesting when a new executive comes in, because I do think there will be personnel moves that belie sort of, this is the path we were taking as of two years ago. Um, invariably those executives fall in love with certain players out of love with other players. I thought they had a really tough call to make on Bogdan um, measuring opportunity cost against, Hey, you know, this guy will keep us, very competitive. I mean, they, they are 
on the other hand, if, if you believe that Halliburton can step in right away as your two, as one of your top wings, as as a playmaking wing, um, maybe they made exactly the right call. Uh, I haven't decided where I come down on that one yet. Um, I think they – I'd like to see them deal Buddy for some uh, additional pieces. Uh, I'm kind of over that. I think he is, again, the co-captain of the There Will Be Knights All-Stars, but I think they're probably teams that overvalue that player – and if there are good offers on the market, I, I think that might happen at some point. Um, I'm curious to see pacing. You know, they played fast two years ago. They were kind of plotting last year. Fox is really fast. Um, he's also getting better, I think, and, and it will have to get better at sort of that half-court orchestration. Um, he is theoretically a good pick-and-roll player. Uh, he's got wonderful vision. Um, he can step by. He, you know, his shooting comes and goes. I was hoping he'd be farther along sort of on that at this point. I'm a big Fox guy. Um, And yeah, I'm just kind of, are they sniffing in the Phoenix area or have they fallen back and now are they kind of playing? Like, like we they've been so in the wilderness for so long. It feels like there's positive trajectory, yet they're falling back. And I, I just don't know what to make of them, but I'm extremely excited about Halliburton. And look, if that guy becomes a, you know, a, if he's a really great second player on a good team, then they should theoretically be a good team in a, in a year or two. I mean, that would be a, a home run to get the second best player on a good team in the draft. I, I'm not ready to even think about that with him. Yeah. Um, you nailed it with the pacing thing. What makes me a little nervous about the Kings, among other things, is um, I think they're going to jostle around before they find an identity. And part of that is that they played weirdly slow last year after being an absolute turbo machine under Dave Yeager in his last year there. Um, And they skew big. And teams that skew big make me a little nervous. Like Harrison Barnes is a 3.5 to 4. Bailitza is a 4. Bagley is a 5, but who will have to play some 4. They have Hassan Whiteside, Jabari Parker, and Rashawn Holmes, all 4s or 5s in the in the Holmes and Whiteside's case. So they skew a little big and a little and thin. Billy on the- and Parker. <laughs> like, it's just a, it's a 4 fest. And, and so they skew a little big, and that makes me a little nervous about their depth and how all the pieces will fit together. And when you throw in, like, you know, how are they going to play? Do we need to get faster again? I agree with you on Fox. I'm super bullish on Fox. Um, and and just even just the piece of, like, is Bagley a five or a four? I just think is going to dog them all year long in terms of playing different kinds of lineups, toggling between identities, which can be a strength or a weakness. I don't see this team um, as in the the playoff race, they could get into the, ba- I have them in the back end of the play in race. Like maybe they're competing for 10th and an outside shot to, to make the playoffs. That's about where I have them. I don't find them um, particularly uh, confusing in that regard. By the way, we should have talked about James Harden in the Philly section. Do you want to talk about James Harden for five minutes? Oh, sure. Yes, let's do. Boy, did it! Boy, did it get noisy on the James Harden beat yesterday. Um, Daryl Morey had to come out and deny that they're trading Ben Simmons, which kind of issued a similar denial about Chris Paul. And you know, I just it's, it, people have to say things. And then there was Woj reporting a couple of things. Number one, that um, the the list of potential trade destinations is expanded beyond Brooklyn and Philadelphia to include. Uh, playoff caliber teams in both conferences who are at least sort of, uh, I think he said something like, are sort of growing more comfortable with the idea of trading for him without assurances that he will resign after two years, etc. Um, it's just a lot of noise. Um, it seems like a lot of posturing from everybody involved t- to me. Um, here, here are my thoughts on some of the topics that came up yesterday. I think the re-signing thing is being wildly overplayed. Oh, like, totally. I think you are trading for James Harden for the next two seasons. And if he re-signs, awesome. He's going to be 33 with the off-court habits that we've seen, asking for a mega contract, whether it's a max or not. I don't think that you're dying to have that contract unless you are a championship contender and you do what the Clippers just did and pay pay Paul George to be a championship contender and knowing you're going to eat pain on the back end. I even think like his player option for 2023 – is being dismissed as like it's a lock that he's going to turn it down. Maybe it is because he'll want to sign a long-term deal of any type, but that's a $47 million player option. Like depending on how the next two years unfolds, I don't think it's like a stone-cold lock he's turning it down. I think he will turn it down. That's certainly the safer bet. That's like a 
a lot of money. I think teams that are interested in trading for him um, are just focused on the next two years. That's it. You're trading for him because you are getting him to win the title in the next two years, which disqualifies any team that doesn't think it can be in that conversation after acquiring James Harden, considering what you have to send out for James Harden. Thing number two, the Simmons thing, I don't care what anybody says now. I don't care what public proclamations are made by either side, what the rumors are. I think in my gut, no sourcing, no speculation, nothing, it, nothing hard. In my gut, if we get to the trade deadline or earlier, and Woj reported today, that Houston wants to get a deal done sooner rather than later if they can find the right deal. Whenever that is, I just I think Simmons for Harden straight up will be on the table. And then you haggle over whether the Sixers have to attach anything else. I just I again there's no sourcing there. It just makes too much intuitive sense to me. Um I, I just don't believe that he will be a completely off the table. The third thing I will say is there are a lot of teams around the league. Who are and, and good teams who are having this sort of discussion in their front offices. You have a lot of people who are like, hard no, hard no. Like, he's, he's going to be bad for our culture. He plays James Ball, not basketball. Does he know how to play basketball anymore? Uh, and then you have like voices within those organizations being like, hey, it's James Harden. Are we really not going to have a meeting about maybe trading for James Harden? This dude finishes in the top three in the MVP balloting every single year. I don't know. I I mean, I know who some of those franchises are. I don't even want to speculate and say names. But I've said before on this podcast, if Tyler Hero and a lot of picks are the price, the Heat have to have a meeting. If Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart and the picks are a price, the Celtics have to have a meeting. It's dereliction of duty to not have a meeting and not have one voice in that organization saying, hey, shouldn't we? consider it i don't know what those teams are doing to be clear i don't know what those teams are doing um but i just think that there was a lot of noise yesterday that i think is sort of i think it's just sort of status quo and do you have any additional thoughts yeah i do um what i'm finding in talking to executives and around the league is those two voices are actually one voice the 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 people who are saying oh the culture it's james ball he doesn't know how to play and Holy crap, it's James Harden, or actually the same people. I, I, It is interesting just in a league where people have a lot of certitude, just how conflicted the scenario is for them because it is so tantalizing. As you say, it's James Harden. You're acquiring arguably a top five player who in the next two years makes you an instant. I, I mean, if you have nothing else, he has dragged you by the scruff of the neck um, into into the playoffs talent right and then you add anything else surrounding him there's that the other thing i want to explore about ben simmons is this if i'm the philadelphia 76ers and i'm going to i'm willing to trade ben simmons are we absolutely certain that there aren't one of 28 other teams who might give you a more attractive package now if the answer is interesting Right. Okay. Because here's the thing: if I'm training, why is it only a conversation with Houston? I'm opening up the phone lines. Well, there we go. Two one five 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 Sixers. You know, put in your best offer. And I, look, if the answer is I want the player who is most likely to help deliver a championship in the next two years, the best answer might be James Harden. But if the if the market is open for Ben Simmons, for you're having a dereliction of duty, and I'm sure they're not because it's a pretty thorough front office by not saying having a whiteboard with 28 other teams and say, what is the best offer here for Ben Simmons? And so that's the thing. It's just like this, this certainty that it's, hey, it's these two guys for one another. I want to hear what the Phoenix Suns might give up for Ben Simmons. Like, I want to hear what any other number of teams. And, and so far as your first point, absolutely. I don't want the next deal. I don't want the next deal for James Harden. I, I like that's the thing. I, and so you are trading for two years, which then again opens up the field, but also only opens up the field le- realistically to teams that feel like he is the thing that can vault you into the title game or the title, the, the NBA finals with um, your, your existing roster, um, because I don't want him on the back that next deal. Well, um, t- I think you nailed it. Like, I think there are several rebuilding teams who would trade a whole lot of stuff to get Ben Simmons as a 10-pole player. 24 years old, made the All-NBA team last year, third team. I just think you look at Joel Embiid, who's 25 or 26, whatever he is, he needs to win now. And so, like, 
right two prospects who are not very good right now but maybe are kind of intriguing plus a couple of picks like that just doesn't do anything for me if i'm if i'm philly uh in that regard and and by the way the last thing the nets offer is another thing that's being dismissed um and i you know i guess maybe houston doesn't want it it's karis lavert is the headline player that's not good enough for them fine maybe that's the case if the nets are willing to put in all the draft assets and I'm not saying they are, and I think they would actually haggle really hard to try and limit the amount of distant future draft picks and swaps they would put into a deal for James Harden because that stuff is dangerous. But if they get to a point where, let's say it's not working, the Nets aren't as good as they think they're going to be, whatever. If they get to a point where they up the ante on the draft assets, I just think history shows you, man, if you get everything, if you get the unprotected swaps and unprotected picks and they're far out in the future, like that's really, really valuable. And I wouldn't scoff at, you might scoff at Levert. Maybe he's not your cup of tea. I like Levert. Maybe, maybe Raphael Stone doesn't. Um, but the draft assets, unprotected in the future, distant future, like selling short, as Wendy wrote last, last week about what the Thunder and the Pelicans are doing. I wouldn't scoff at that. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't want to talk about James Harden anymore. Uh, I, who's the next team on your list? Let me go to my list. Um. Where's my list? They were the Brooklyn Nets, actually, in this context. So I'm I, I vetoing the go. Brooklyn. I'm yeah, vetoing the Brooklyn Nets. Veto. Your list, man. Uh, the the three teams remaining on my list are teams I've talked about recently, so I'm not that psyched. But the most interesting one to me is the Utah Jazz, uh, and the Utah Jazz are on the list simply for this reason: they're loaded. Yes. Okay. They're loaded one to eight, one to nine. Um, Boyan Bogdanovich, who missed the bubble, is back key source of secondary offense. A lot of their pet sets are based around his shooting. Hey, man, there are nights where he's primary offense. I mean, he's yeah. really freaking good. He averaged 20 a game for the last two years. Uh, re-signed Jordan Clarkson. Not my cup of tea, but played well for them last year. Derek Favors, fair deal. We'll back up Rudy Gobert so they don't sink in the minutes that he sits, play a little bit with him. And as I said previously, their numbers with Favors and Gobert on the floor, as much as everyone scoffs on that, uh, we're very good for three years running, plus eight per hundred possessions, plus nine per hundred possessions, plus five per hundred possessions. Good numbers. Um, Mike Conley was surging toward the end of the, the season before the virus. Then he missed time in the bubble for family reasons and other stuff. Um, can he give you one more year of potentially good shot creation um, so, so that your offense is a little diversified? Gobert, Defensive Player of the Year. Um, you know, seems to be a good bet that they'll have a competent to very good defense. The question to me and the confusing thing to me is, and I'm interested in your take on this, having said all that, do they belong in the inner circle of teams who can challenge the Lakers or are they still just a nice playoff team who's going to get lucky to be out in the fir- to get beyond the first round? I mean, this is the enduring question with this team and it, it is its current incarnation. I mean, all right, so let's start with Mitchell, right? Because I, let's just take it as an article of fact that without – a shot creator of that caliber, you're not even in the conversation, right? Um, and we think there's enough volume and efficiency there. I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm ready to kind of go in on that. And then you have a defensive linchpin. Um, I, I think they are. I'm look. I'm still a Clipper guy as, as a num- strong number two. I have issues as everybody does. Obviously, the Lakers are going to go. Lord knows. Actually, who knows? They, they might phone in the regular season and just go sixteen and two. Uh, in, in the postseason, but I think there is a really competitive scrum for three that includes Utah, Denver, Portland, um, and I, I, I just I like it defensively a lot. You know, Bogdanovich is really big; like the guy isn't a liability defender. O'Neal is fantastic; he was sort of a last cut for me. Um, I love that they can scheme different ways. Um, I think Favors has become an incredibly useful player for a guy whose kind of profile isn't generally what I like, you know, a non-stretch big. Um, like, New Orleans got great production in, in terms of good, f- like, f- like they were really good when he was on the floor last season. Changed um, their whole defense. Their changed, surge in, exactly. the, in the regular season coincided exactly with Derek Favors right. coming back. Now, it's not Gobert, but, like, actually, it lets you play a little up to touch. It lets you kind of, like, you can mix up the schemes with, with, with Favors. Um, Ingles to me is like my favorite six man. You know why? 
He can run pick and roll. He can shoot off flares. Like he's not small. He defends like crazy. Like just like the consummate 28 minute a guy who's just going to eat minutes and eat them productively. And I just, I, I kind of love, again, I'm not a Clarkson guy, but there's just a lot there. There's great depth. Um, I also feel like they're a particularly good team at sort of finding gems. Um, you know, guys who can give you productive 10 minutes here and there. Um, one or two of these players will, whether it's Hughes or, or someone else. Like, I, I really like it. And, you know, Mike Conley's obviously a question mark just because, God, he, he just didn't play well last year coming off, off the injury. But um, I, I'm there. I'm, I'm there for the contending for number three, whatever the hell that's worth in the West. They're starting five. Conley, Mitchell, Bogdanovich, O'Neal, Gobert, plus 10 per 100 possessions last year. Very good on both ends of the floor. And by the way, I think most it could of, be better this year. Most of their core lineups were, were quite good last year. Ingles on the bench means the reunification of the Ingles favors pick and roll, which is a beautiful thing to watch. They're great together. Um, we're forgetting Neon, by the way. Like, the guy shoots 40% from three. Like, hustles like crazy. I, I like, like, Neon's not, that's a good player. I think he's going to be this the, the sort of swing guy. I think there are going to be nights where he's out of the rotation and nights where he's in the rotation because they don't trust his defense. Or I, I, I would assume they don't trust his defense. But I like I like George. I think he's going to be Is he really that bad? Player. I didn't notice. No, he's yeah, smart. He he's smart. He's smart, but he's a little slow, but he's smart. Um, I, I My hesitancy, I so I have them below. I, I'm picky about who I have in that next tier below the Lakers as like, I'm ready to anoint them as this is a legitimate potential threat. I don't have Utah there. And my hesitancy goes back to what I said before, which is to have two guys who can create their own shot at an elite level in the playoffs is is just such a determining factor to me. And I don't think they have it. I think they have Mitchell. And look, if Mitchell takes a leap and he took a like a ginormous leap in the playoffs, like he can't sustain that. But if he takes a leap, maybe it's all moot. Maybe, maybe the concerns are all moot. But Gobert's not a creator of offense. I don't care. I stop with the screen assists. If I hear screen assists one more time on a freaking Utah Jazz, bro, oh, hey, did you know Rudy Gobert leads the league in screen assists? Yeah, we all know. We all know because you say it five times a game. Okay, we all get it. Screen assists. It's not a thing. Stop saying it. Uh, maybe I, get to, I guess it's a thing. Bogdanovich is really good. But when the game slows down against an elite defense, what do they really have that scares you? And it's to me, it's still just Mitchell. And like when Denver got their together in the first round last year, when their defense was not just a tire fire, when Gary Harris came back and suddenly you had to work to get baskets against them, all they had was Mitchell. That's all they had. And their offense fell apart. And by the way, their offense falls apart in the playoffs every year. You can blame it on bad shooting. And in one of the Rocket series, I think 2019, that was, they missed a, just an inordinate amount of open threes. But, you know, that's part of not having a second elite shot creator because you don't get to the rim as much. You don't get to the line as much. You turn the ball over a lot. They've been sneakily a turnover prone team. And it, it's also like, it, it's a little boot and holesery in which they blame their playoff losses on bad shooting every single year. Like it's like, that was always the thing with the Hawks. Well, we just missed a lot of open threes. Yeah, well you lost. Like, and, you, and we heard the same story last year. So I, I kind of need to see it I think they're on the verge. Like I really like to see them. I think they're going to be a really good regular season team. They're a problem in the playoffs with their continuity and their flow and all that. I, I just think when you talk about can you get to the conference finals and really push it hard there, I'm not quite there with them yet. But the reason they're on my list is I look at their roster and I'm like, I, I like everything here. I like everything here. Why do I have this hesitancy in me to put them in this? Like I have Denver one little tier above them um, because of those two elite shot creators. But maybe I'm wrong. But I that I, and maybe maybe Conley, maybe Conley is is the right. answer. Maybe Conley has one more great year in him. So this is why I'm confu- This is why I'm roiled with confusion about the Jets. Right. And, and to me, I, I I totally concede all that. I I think I'm a little more comfortable saying in the aggregate they will get a second shot creator most nights. You know, either because you know Bogdanovich I agree with that. Is, is working against a mismatch. Ingles has one of his. Hey, I'm running second side pick and roll, and we're destroying you because you know we have that flow. And that's what we do to you. We, we kind of surgically pick you apart because Conley is the old Conley. And they're going to be nights where that little left hand, he's going to do that stutter step, you know, boom, off the screen, three-pointer. You know, he goes four for nine 
um, from distance and to say nothing of being able to set up guys and, and, and do what he does. And because I also think they just don't, they have a very rare off night. They don't make a lot of defensive mistakes. Whereas Denver, Hey, it can go either way. Uh, by the way, I like Denver a lot, you know, and, and, but I and, think Denver is going to be awesome. And I think, the, I, th- I think the Jeremy Grant thing is there's two, I mean, he was good. Fine. I think Denver is going to be awesome. Now, whether they can defend well enough to really dial it up in the playoffs when it matters, we'll see. But I think Denver is going to be awesome. I yeah, think Denver is better. I think Denver's better than Utah. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, I mean, I, I think, I mean, look, I like Grant. I, I like Jermichael Green. <laughs> you know, like, is this not, uh, that's not a problem for me. Uh, yeah. Defensively is kind of, is the question there. And, and by the way, and Mike Titan, I mean, there are moments when, like you know where personnel that doesn't change actually just gets better at what they're doing either through reps um or because they get smarter and older which is a thing i mean older teams tend to defend well they're getting older um in, in a good way not aging out i mean jamal murray is not the same player he was two years ago um porter is not going to be a complete moron defensively forever he's actually i think projects to be a really good defender in terms of body and um in movement but uh yeah, they're, how about, they're how about this? M- Michael Porter being being, <laughs> being better at defense might inoculate the Nuggets from some bad runs against them. Yeah, inoculate um, might inoculate them. Anyway, that's enough Michael Porter Jr. content. Um, the Jazz Pelton has them at forty-one wins, third in the West, uh, five thirty. But but third, but like third to eighth is you know a whole thing. Five thirty-eight has them forty-one wins. Uh, one, two, three, fifth in the West, six in the West, something like that. It's hard to tell on their site. Two uh, percent chance of winning the finals, six percent chance of making the finals. I feel like that's about right. Uh, I I don't buy them at the same level quite as the Nuggets. But again, to, to Conley Bogdanovich, like one of those guys pops. Mitchell gets a little better. Maybe my concerns are moot by the end, and that's why I'm confused by them. There is an upside for them where enough things go right that they do notch up a tier. I just, I can't put them quite there yet. Um, just who, just give me, so you had Brooklyn. I just, as we round out here, I'm interested to see who else is on your list. Brooklyn, who else? I think that was it. I gave you the first four. Okay. I so gave you, you had Portland, Brooklyn. Sac, uh, Washington and New Orleans. Wow. We only overlapped on one team. New I Orleans. went weird this year. I, I totally went weird this year. So my full list was New Orleans, Philadelphia, which we got Utah. We got to, so the two teams we didn't get were the Warriors, uh, who I think are right there with the Pelicans is the most confusing team in the NBA. I have just no idea what to project. I mean, I have an idea. Like, I was skeptical on the Warriors last year. I picked them to miss the playoffs. We'll never know how that would have played out had Steph not gotten injured, but they sure did not look very good. I've talked about them a lot recently, so I don't want to belabor it. I, I have them play in mix. Like, I, I have I have Phoenix above Golden State. Um I just, I, but, but, you know, there's just a lot of question marks. How do all these new pieces fit? Do they have enough shooting? What does Draymond look like? Where is Draymond? Where is Wiseman? What's going on? Uh, and the other team I have is Boston. Oh, interesting. And the, and the reason I have Boston is just, again, I talked about them on a recent episode, but Kemba's knee is the obvious one, right? Like, we just don't know how that, I mean, they're, they seem pretty confident he's going to come back and be fine, but we'll see. They lost some depth with Hayward. I think their depth at the three and the four is a little shaky, and their depth at the five is really good. But I, I, I not like having three really good centers is not that interesting to me. Um, and it, it, the, it, and so in my head, I have them sort of down a tier from where they were last year, where they made the conference finals. However, my confusion is Walker, Smart, Brown, Tatum. That's a hell of a foursome. It got them to the conference finals. That foursome with Tice and a couple other, B.O. You know, Grant Williams hit some corners, whatever, got them to the conference finals. So why does it feel in my gut, like why am I a little more pessimistic in my gut when that foursome did all the heavy lifting for them until the conference finals when Gordon Hayward came back? And, and on top of that, to your internal improvement point, what if Tatum gets 8% better and Jalen Brown gets 12% better? Like that changes their team completely. So I have this dissonance in my soul about I'm a little worried about the Celtics given some of the issues I brought up, but they still have that foursome and at least three of that foursome should get better this year. Like Smart should keep improving too. He's still, he's not old. He's not past his prime. He's in his prime. So I just, I, p- tell me what your temperature take is yeah. on Boston before we go. You, you kind of you stole exactly what I was going to say, which is I, I sense this, gloominess about the Celtics that hey, it's a, it's a it's a step back year 
Kemba's hurt, um, you know, Hayward depth. I just, I, I exactly what you said. I'm like, give me those four guys. And by the way, like they'll get some nice piece on the buyout market. You know, I, they're, they're fine up top. I like the Williams guys. Um, I don't know Langford as a player well enough. I know he's hurt too, by the way, he's going to miss uh, time too, which worries me. So, I, but I just feel like, okay, they'll hang around. And I know that they're that four man unit and whoever, by the way, I mean, what's so great about that four man unit, I don't even care. I mean, you've got matchup considerations, Tice or Williams or Thompson, whatever, like it'll be fine. And I just like that's not a lineup I want to go. Or with. the other Williams, two Williams. You could put Grant, Grant or center or Time Lord at center. So to me, and yeah, okay, can, where's Teague right now in his career? Like, yeah, there are questions, but I don't want to bury the lead. And the lead is holy crap, right? Like the lead is that is going to be a damn good defensive team. And by the way, it's not like Kemba's absence hurts that at all, right? Like, like it, it to me those three. Two, three, four guys, interchangeable defensively. Um, Smart gives you stretch now. God, I never would have thought. I'm not saying the selection is always great, but in the aggregate, it's fine. I just like it. I, I don't. I don't worry so much. And I know that there's this this, this gloom. I see them kind of being picked. I, I don't even care what the regular season is. It's not a unit I want to face um, this June or July. Well, or my part of the worry I think is that those lineups. Um, that you're talking about were, were not great offensive lineups. They were just okay, mediocre offensive lineups in some cases uh, and, and amazing defensive lineups. One of the things that Hayward's absence takes away from me is I really liked the smart Brown, Tatum, Hayward, Tice construction where it's just all defense, like good freaking luck. You can't score on that team without Kemba. They can still play that kind of lineup, but just doesn't have Gordon Hayward, which means it's a lot less shooting and a lot less shot creation. I like that as a sort of card in Brad Stevens' deck. Um, but, you know, look, I'm with you. That foursome is, is really, really good. And I find myself sort of wondering, why do I have Boston behind Milwaukee as a, as a threat? And why do I have them even behind Miami and maybe Brooklyn as a threat? Um, am I overthinking it? And I, and I just don't know. My soul is torn about I think, the 17-time world champions. I think there's another answer, which is all of a sudden the East is actually kind of decent up top. Like, it, there are just a lot of pretty good to very good to possibly – lurking great teams and we haven't had that in a long time and and why boston is interesting is I mean, the projection systems pelton has them fifth in the east 39 wins 538 has them second in the entire nba with a 15 percent chance to win the championship which is second to the Lakers, 21% chance, 27% chance to make the finals, which is, again, second to the Lakers. Something, and 538 loves Tatum, loves Walker, loves Smart, and they were high on the Celtics last year. They were also, they're also unbelievably high on the Sixers, which I saw that, and I wanted to throw my laptop on the floor because I, I can't get sucked in again, 538. Um, so something clicks with them on the Celtics and, and versus some other projection systems. So maybe that's just sort of, representative of some whatever confusion i feel i'm actually well, curious what is factoring into that massive projection like what are they what are they I, what are they seeing what is the what is the formula seeing i don't know but it really surprised me and i think it's going to be a fun season well we, we are close to tip off my friend and kevin this is always one of my favorite pods of the year you have a great piece about the clippers up on espn.com this year how the clippers might pick to win the title last season whoops and uh, are going to try to rebound from an unfathomable embarrassment at the hands of the Denver Nuggets in the playoffs and a coaching change and some roster changes. Read that. Read everything Kevin writes. Mr. Arnovitz, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me.